Firstly, thank you, Dr. Jernava, for agreeing to be here. We are very excited for this. And thank you, everyone else, for joining us in, at our third event, which is a part of four-part series that we titled Economics for the Clueless Scientists. So this event is organized by Penn Science Policy and Diplomacy Group, PSPDG for short. PSPDG is a student organization which helps in creating opportunities for students at UPenn to get hands-on experience in science policy, diplomacy, and communication. Please go to the website to look at the various events that PSPDG organizes, and you can also follow them on Twitter. So we know that for the last 40 years, incommunicality has soared with each recovery from an economic downturn, leading to more gains at the top and more precarity at the bottom. As the US economy recovers from this latest pandemic induced downturn, many pundits and economists have claimed that the labor market is too hot and is leading to higher inflation. Even though there are six, more than six million Americans who want a job, and don't have a job. So we, today's talk is titled, Are We There Yet? Econ Income Inequality and the Promise of Full Employment, where we will discuss different aspects of this issue and potential solutions with Dr. Pavlina Chernova. Dr. Chernova is an Associate Professor of Economics at Bard College and Research Associate at the Levy Economics Institute. Her interests include macroeconomic theory and policy, employment policy, monetary theory, institutional and post-Keynesian theory, and the effects of pro-employment pro policies on health, social, and gender outcomes. Her research has garnered a lot of attention in the country and globally, and she has collaborated with policymakers from the states and abroad on designing and evaluating employment programs. She is the author, most recently, of The Case for a Job Guarantee, which was listed in the Financial Times 2020 Economic Summer books. So you should read that book. So yeah, I think we can get started. If at any point throughout the talk, if you have any questions, please submit them over the Q&A box and we will discuss them later uh, during the Q&A session after the talk ends. So. Yeah, without further further ado, let's hand it over to Dr. Chernova. I'm glad to be here. And uh, today I would like to talk about um, the connection between inequality and unemployment. If we, any cursory read of the media uh, and so we get the, the national conversation is very excited about the progress we've made in labor markets. You know, there's lots of talk about job shortage. Um, uh, there is a fair amount of discussion that we might be at full employment. So really the question here is, are we there yet? And uh, what does that all have to do with this uh, persistent income inequality that is now well established that people are quite aware of, but that has been also growing. And so um, another question would be, can we do things better? Can we do things in a different way? Can we recover um, in a way that we don't uh, necessarily reproduce or support the engines that produce income inequality? So I uh, have some charts to show you. And just so we make sure we have the stylized facts, um, the same stylized facts uh, in front of us. And so the question is, have we seen a strong job recovery? The answer is decidedly yes. We have seen very strong jobs numbers. We have seen very strong revisions and we haven't seen quite as robust a recovery for some time, especially since we're coming on the heels of a very protracted uh, recession or jobless recovery rather after 2008. So if you were to look at the official situation, the official statistics, uh, the blue line is going to tell you the official unemployment numbers. The red line is the expanded definition uh, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. 
um, that uh, counts people that are not typically included in the official numbers. And so there are a couple of things that you want to note here. Yes, we are pretty much close to what were the pre-pandemic official unemployment level, uh, unemployment rate lows. The second thing you want to keep in mind is that if you actually take a broader look out of the unemployment situation, we usually have about twice as many people who are in need of decent work um, than what the official numbers would report. I, you know, by comparison, when you can look at this picture and you see the blue line, it doesn't look so bad, right? I mean, 3.6% looks like a, a, a good post-war low, but I want us to interrogate this idea and whether that should be acceptable. All right. So uh, this is a very popular chart by Calculated Risk that reports how long it takes to recover the lost jobs. And sorry, if you lose, you know, how many months would it take after the onset of a recession to actually come back um, and recover the losses? And what we have noticed is that since the 70s and the 80s, it just is taking longer and longer and longer. So when you hear a conversation about a jobless recovery and a protracted jobless recovery, this is what we're talking about. That the pain that people have felt in a recession takes a very long while to work itself out and jobs to return. But by comparison, when you look at the great, the latest um, recession, the COVID-induced recession, we had a pretty quick bounce back up. Of course, it was also the most dramatic decline in the post-war era. Um, all right, so all good news, um, but when people are saying we're at full employment, um, they don't typically look at the flows. Where are people coming from? When they take up jobs, where are they coming from? Are they coming from the official numbers, the unemployment numbers? Or are they coming from outside the labor force? And labor force are people who are either working or looking for work. Those who have, who are not looking for work in that particular very narrow window of the survey week, um, they are just not counted. They're considered quote unquote voluntarily unemployed. And there are other measures of figuring out why they are not working. They could be discouraged. Uh, they may have looked for a very long time. But what we're noticing is that many more people are coming from outside of the labor force into jobs than are coming from unemployment. And so, you know, when you hear a conversation about is there more room to grow, actually the numbers bear this out. You look at the last few months of job growth, you see people coming from outside the labor force, you, you realize that there's a very uh, high pent up demand for employment that's hidden um, uh, and is not told by the official numbers. So yes, there is a lot of room to grow we have a collapse in the labor force participation rate. Um, there was a kind of a decline after 2008 financial crisis, then another decline uh, in the COVID recession. If we were to go back to our highs of the 90s, we have a lot of room to, to grow. Uh, jobs for all, one way uh, in which I would like to look at it is just to um, look at the expanded definition of unemployment. And in that definition, um, I'd like to include people who are working part-time for economic reasons, meaning they can't find full-time employment. So they're juggling a bunch of jobs, uh, trying to make ends meet. And so this, this talks, you know, speaks to the precarity and again, the demand for, for stable full-time full -time employment. So actually, when we, when we take a broader view, we're looking at around 16 million people who are either unemployed, um, working in an involuntary part-time or not in the labor force who are ready to take a job uh, now. Okay, so we have a gap. Uh, if you look at job openings, all data is flawed. Uh, so, you know, we always have to like preface our discussion, all data is flawed. But even if you look at this picture, even in the best of times, there's always a gap. There is a shortage. There is a quantitative aspect to unemployment. This is not just a simple mismatch. There are jobs here, but not there. There is a, in the aggregate, there is a shortage. But even the aggregate picture is not a good picture. I also like to look at it at a regional level. I like to look at a state level at uh, cities and urban centers. You see the stark divides that these communities um, you know, experience when it comes to jobs. So for example, you know, 2000, this is again, pre-pandemic, right? This was the good times before the pandemic, the good times to which we are returning now. If you take a regional approach and you take a geographic approach, you notice that there are uh, communities that persistently have six, eight, 10 double digit unemployment rates in the best of times. 
And there are other ways in which you can look at this just over time and see how some of these communities don't ever uh, have good employment, robust employment. So, so there, there is um, a, a, an acute need for good jobs in many places. All right. We want to talk about the job quantity, but we want to talk about the job quality dimension as well. This is, I'm just throwing these numbers uh, here. There's so many ways in which we could talk about precarity, but just the recent report that came out by Oxfam, one in three Americans earn below 15 dollars an hour. This is uh, this is very important. It's significant. Um, this speaks to the, the kind of the difficulty that a third of Americans has um, uh, have uh, uh, to make make ends meet, pay rent. Uh, you know uh, that the costs are are high for healthcare, education, housing, etc. And then you look at it by demographic breakdown. Forty percent of of uh, women actually earn below fifteen. Forty six percent of Hispanic Latinx. Forty seven Black workers. Fifty seven of working single parents. So uh, we we are talking about economic insecurity that is experienced uh, uh, quite acutely by uh, different groups. And there's there are other things like wage theft and unstable employment and uh, many other dimensions to economic insecurity. All right, what did the, this, this comes from inequality.org, what did the pandemic do? We've all read the news. We know that wealth uh, for uh, billionaires has grown, uh, uh, gone up, it has skyrocketed, 70% increase in wealth. So this is not income, this is wealth inequality, but then corporate profits, that's an income flow, though those have gone up by 50%. And this is only within the year and a half from March 2020 to October 2021. In, in one year and a half, we have these extraordinary appreciations right, in, in uh, income and assets. Uh, yes, total wages did grow and public policy was distinctly different to stabilize the economy from COVID and that helped jobs uh, wage growth. Um, consumer prices did rise, uh, but the increase in prices since October has eroded some of the uh, wage gains. Okay, so what are we looking at? I So coming back to uh, Rupa's introduction, some time ago, I had looked at the uh, inequality uh, data that was produced by uh, Tomapi Keti and his collaborators, Emmanuel Saez. Um, and um, that is when, you know, inequality captured our attention, you know, the, the world's attention. And I looked specifically at cohorts in the United States, then what you would find is that during the 20 year period from 97 to 2017, the vast majority of households have lost income, right? Their real average real income was lower in 2017 than it was in 1997. But when you go to the wealthier cohorts, income went up during the period and it went up faster the wealthier a household was. And so you have this you know, rapid income inequality, but also, you know, this engine that supports incomes of those at the top. And so that's the, this is the, the, the chart that kind of made some waves some years back that illustrated the engine of growth and how that distributed the gain. So in this particular chart, I only, again, using PTT data, I was only looking at, at expansions. And so, you know, the old story that a rising boat a rising tide lifts all boats, doesn't seem to be true, did not seem to be true. Um, and for the last 40, 50 years, the majority of the gains went to the top 10%, while the bottom 90% of families were slowly losing ground in the post-war period. And then that completely reversed where in the last two expansions, they didn't gain any ground. In fact, during the expansion and the first expansion, they lost ground. Um, so, uh, so this is one way of looking at it. There are many ways to look at inequality, but what I think we want to do here is to link um, the labor market engine generating uh, employment to inequality. And uh, one way to think about it is that um, for the vast majority of people, our income is derived from labor income, right? Wages and salaries. There is a component um, in the population that derives income from interest, from rent, from you know shares, you know asset ownership. Um, but when we think about income inequality, we want to say we want to look at how labor markets are performing because they are delivering the income uh, support for the vast majority of us. 
Okay. So, you know, I would say that in a sense, inequality is by design. There are certain ways in which the economy works in this inequitable way. I'll, I'll talk about labor markets in a moment. But whenever we are faced with a crisis, we take very concrete decisions how to stabilize the economy. Policymakers make very specific, um, you know, past specific policies. And for, for, a while, for quite some time in the era where we saw this the starkest inequality in the 80s, uh, we had kind of embraced this trickle-down economics model, which is essentially um, based on giving tax cuts to the top, reducing top marginal tax rates, uh, with the expectation that you know that will create incentives for more investment and then job growth. But of course, we know that that never uh, worked. That period of trickle-down economics, you know, uh, reduction in tax rates, uh, was associated with the longest jobless recoveries. So it is by design, because if the policy aims to reduce, to, to improve the incomes at the top, right, you take away less, then those incomes are going to recover first if the labor market has not recovered, if you have a jobless recovery. So those who derive the incomes at the top will have more to keep. Those who derive the incomes from labor markets are faced with a jobless recovery. They will not uh, catch up. So that's one explanation of how policy can reproduce income inequality. Well, you know, in 2009, our attention turned to the banking sector. That was the primary focus of stabilization. You know, the argument was we need to stabilize credit markets. Uh, we need to stop this meltdown in financial assets. And so long as we stabilize the balance sheet, then banks will be incentivized to now begin lending again to support investment structure, to support employment. So you notice how the transmission mechanism starts from banking, from financial assets, asset prices, then goes through investment, then to employment, but we were faced with the largest, longest employment, uh, unemployment, um, jobless recovery. And so if you're deriving your income from financial ma markets, from shares, from asset prices, you know, policy by design stabilize your income. So you will be at the top 10%, top 1%, top 0.1% of the income distribution. Um, and if you're, again, uh, the bottom 90%, no, no wonder, you know, we have this stark income inequality as a byproduct of the way we went about stabilizing the economy. We could have created jobs. We could have created employment. We could have directly contributed to economic activity with some specific measures. Those are on the fiscal side, right? We, we expect Congress to then pass budgets that will then grease the economic wheels. And this is associated with the standard Keynesian priming the pump model. And what that is, is more or less what we saw during COVID. Government comes in, passes an enormous budget, gives money, spends money, invests, and that is then, then, um, uh, then filters through different sectors, different industries, and provides income support to people directly. Now, if you provide income support directly, um, that is considered transfer income, and that is not um, a labor market derived income, right? So you still have to pay attention to what happens to labor markets. So in COVID, you have, we have 14% unemployment rate, or 22, looking at the expanded definition. Um, and we are providing a lot of pandemic support, income support, which was the right thing to do. Um, that will be um, income that is generated through um, government uh, support, but not through production and employment, right? So if you want the production and employment engine to kickstart, because that's what's going to carry you over in the expansion, you want to make sure that you kickstart those economic wheels. And, you know, different countries did this in a different way. Uh, in some countries, the government simply paid the wages. They said to companies, don't lay off the workers. We're going to cover the wages. Uh, they're threatened employees. Don't lay them off. Um, we'll patch you over. And then uh, unemployment did not shoot up the way that it did in the United States. In the U.S., we accepted the kind of the inevitability of unemployment. We spent far more than other countries. The U.S. spent about 26% of GDP, which is extraordinary by, in post-war numbers. Uh, by, by comparison, you know, Denmark spent 5, 6, 7% of GDP. So, you know, you know Germany. 
Uh, you know, Germany had, you know, 5.5% unemployment at the peak, we had 14 plus at the peak. So the way we go about stabilizing the economy matters uh, for people as employment and income stability. So, you know, fortunately, uh, the economy was able to, re you know, to restore a good number of those jobs. But if you, you know, that, that recovery was very rapid at the beginning, and then it kind of stalled. It's been going on, but there are people still outside the labor market. So um, when I say that labor markets are fundamentally unequal, this is another key part of the story. That labor markets typically work in such a way that they create employment conditions, favorable employment conditions for the employable, uh, as the employers will see them. You know, that's how employers would, would, would consider candidates, which would be high wage, high skill workers. Those who work in lower wage, more precarious uh, employment are the ones that typically are the first casualties of a downturn. And they also tend to catch the jobs train last. So we have this last in first out effect that is well documented. There is a very clear race gender dimension to, to this, this, this mechanism. So if you're priming the pump, you're, if you're creating growth, you're creating employment opportunities, the labor market in, is, works in such a way that it first improves the employment conditions of the middle income, high income folk, and they don't tend to see a lot of unemployment, and those at the bottom of the income distribution are last. So I'm suggesting that if you think about policy, we might just want to do things differently. You know, maybe we want to create direct employment and income opportunities for those who have the most precarious employment situation. And that could be done with a, uh, a public employment program uh, of the kind that we did, you know, we had during the New Deal. So that's what I will talk about in a moment. But I want to kind of take stock of what I said and to kind of summarize what the paradigm, the policy paradigm is. So the, the status quo, the convention is that Unemployment is natural. There's just not much that we could do about it. 3.5% unemployment rate is pretty good, right? That's the status quo. Even if that means 16 million people in need of, of employment, that's considered to be full employment. But probably worse, in the economic um, parlance and theory, there is this idea that unemployment is actually necessary, that unemployment acts as a buffer against inflation. And the policymaker is faced with this choice. There is a trade-off between either more jobs and, and more inflation or less inflation and more unemployment. And this is this trade-off that you may have heard. Uh, it's called the NIRU. It's, it's a term for, for this natural, uh, non-accelerating inflation, inflation rate of unemployment. That is really what like, central banks, bankers talk about, OK? The trouble in all this is that, as we have seen in the last two years, central bankers themselves recognize that this relationship has broken down and they don't fully understand the inflation mechanism. They don't fully understand if this is a causal relationship. But if you listen to Fed speak today, you will hear how they are trying to manage credit conditions so that they can deal with inflation. The translation of this is that you want to decelerate like investment and employment so that you don't quote unquote overheat the economy, assuming that inflation comes from just too much income, like too many people having jobs. And that is fundamentally flawed on empirical basis, on, you know, they, they themselves recognize it. And on, on the basis that we have alternatives, like even if it is, if it is true that you can fight inflation by in unemploying people, and yes, you take away their income, their livelihoods, they're not going to spend. Even if that were true, why would this be the policy paradigm? Why should we fight inflation in this way? We have other, other means to do that. Um, so, you know, the Fed is doing this very gentle dance because, you know, they don't believe in the Naira relationship, but they're trying, they're charged with fighting inflation. They don't know what to do. But what we've understood from COVID is that um, government, the fiscal side is really in the driver, driver's seat. Uh, and there are a bunch of other lessons from COVID that maybe we can discuss in the Q&A. Uh, I won't go into that. But the reason why we had such a robust recovery in the labor market is because we had a robust fiscal response. While in 2008 and 2009, 
We had a fiscal commission. We tried to balance, you know, to reduce expenditure. Uh, you know, we we pulled back uh, far too quickly. There was sequestration of public spending. It was just uh, kind of an austerity mode uh, public policy. Oh, okay. so so how should we approach this this question? Should we always dump into the economy twenty six percent of GDP so we can re recover the labor market? You know, is or should we employ these extraordinary measures of fiscal spending to stabilize an economy? In some cases, yes, that would be necessary. A pandemic is, is probably one of those. But there are also direct solutions, even in a pandemic, that are more surgical, more targeted, and create more bang for the buck. So if, with respect to labor markets, I want to suggest that the direct employment solution is quicker, faster, and more effective than this indirect solution that dominates the paradigm that attempts to stimulate private sector initiative investment and hope and pray that the jobs will come. So we want to think about pre-distribution. How do we allow people to generate income through employment opportunity? And you combine this with redistribution once income has been eroded, then there is a way to redistribute, but we really want to change the engines. We want to prevent that engine that creates too much wealth at the top, and we want to create an engine that's missing of robust wage growth at the bottom. All right, so um, I'm just going to say a word about this. In my own work, I try to stress that economists and macroeconomists specifically can benefit from the work that is done and the public in a health economics and public health that understands the deep scarring effects of unemployment and understand unemployment as a social determinant of health. They're well documented and well established. The mortality effects, the suicide effect, the, the, there's, some, there's some debate on exactly on the suicide relationship, but there's the mortality effect is well established, the deaths of despair, the physical and mental health, the scarring income effects that extend not just to the unemployed, but to their families. And so when you add all of that, we understand that accepting unemployment as natural is actually accepting this paradigm of waste, neglect, ill health. Um, and we can then start thinking about policy in terms of preventing these health effects and scarring effects. So if somebody loses employment, and then they fall into this downward spiral that um, you know, creates these very conditions like physical and mental health that then prevent them from regaining employment, right? We want to prevent this vicious cycle. We want to provide the employment opportunity so they don't have uh, the long-term unemployment spell. And in that sense, I think the direct employment approach does the job too. just give work to those who are seeking it. So what would that look like? Well, let's start thinking about assurance, uh, employment assurance, that there is assurance around the corner. There's some guarantee that when one is seeking work, they will always find it and there will be a solution, employment solution for them should they need it. So I say don't think about full employment is because that term has been hijacked. It is not useful anymore. Full employment means anything. Uh, you know, and, and economists constantly debate whether, you know, it's 3.5, it's 7.5, it's 20%, it's meaningless. Um, and, and the full employment idea has been used to undermine specific policy design that has centered around the right to work and guaranteeing employment. And this is, you know, it may seem like a novel idea. I mean, I think over the last few years, the, the job guarantee and the right to work has kind of re-entered the conversation, but certainly not a new idea. It, it has, there has been, you know, there's a long history of people engaging in this question that um, legislatively, people need to have some sort of recourse where they can have a legally enforceable access to employment. And that's the rights framework. But typically, economists would say, well, it's all very nice to have. These are aspirational goals, but we can't really do it. And the truth is, is not that, that that's not correct. We, of course, we can't get, create and guarantee employment for anyone who is seeking. And we have many forerunners 
that show us how to do it. All right. So, um, so I'd like to think about these together as a rights framework and a macroeconomic framework, uh, because the rights framework deals with the quantity aspects. We guarantee it to every single person, irrespective of their situation and condition, whatever, uh, uh, whenever they seek employment, they are uh, provided. And then the quality aspect is important because you know, the rights framework also recognizes it just because you guaranteed employment, if it is punitive, it is terrible, if it is um, uh, poorly paid, that is not really guaranteeing that right. Um, and so macroeconomic policy can design these structural interventions that are based on direct public employment over the long run to secure this, this right. So I will talk briefly about how the job guarantee does that. I will tell you a little bit about the developments around the job guarantee. Uh, on the policy level and how we might go about doing this and hopefully leave uh, time for questions. But I'm happy actually to like take a breath and just see if people have questions now or shall I just, shall I just carry on? Carry on? Yeah. Okay, all right, let's, let's go on. Okay, so the job guarantee, as I said, there are many forerunners. But the very basic idea is that the public sector provides the missing employment. Right? Private sector is going to create however many jobs, expansions or recessions. Nonprofit sector is going to create however many jobs. The public sector conventional will create however many jobs. But you can carve out a public service employment program that provi provides jobs on demand, meaning as people need them, they are supplied. And that could be a hybrid model. It could be public service and nonprofit work and cooperative work and various other kind of participatory models. We have examples around the world, the largest of which is India's Rural Employment Guarantee, which is really kind of a under, uh, I think, uh, you know, in, in the West, people don't know a lot, a lot about it, but it is such an important um, a case study. So it's a permanent policy. It's a direct employment approach. And uh, it is a, an additional. It's not taking away jobs from somewhere else. Um, it will be centrally funded because like all macro policies and employment safety and safety nets, the employment safety net will also be federally funded, locally administered. Um, you can think of it as a safety net. You can think of it as a transitional opportunity to other employment opportunities. It needs to be voluntary, it cannot be punitive and coercive. And by virtue of creating the um, basic job, that pre becomes the standard in the economy as a whole. You know, now that becomes the floor uh, for wages that um, then will need to be paid elsewhere in the economy. And um, all literature on the job guarantee typically highlights the care economy for very specific reasons. Um, you know, there isn't like a very, you know, concrete commercial return on taking care of the environment, the people, communities, and yet these are underserved areas of uh, public concern. And thus that is uh, an appropriate focus for job creation. Okay, we have a model, we've, we've run it through a pretty, pretty robust, uh, uh, commonly used macroeconomic model. The, the, the program is stabilizing, does not create inflation, which is really the most important aspect here, that um, we don't have to sacrifice full employment, jobs for all, in the fight for inflation. We have a, a stabilizer that um, is anti-inflationary. Okay. What it's not, I always like to say, this is not like forced labor, you know, it's not punitive, uh, it's not a handout, uh, it's not once in a while, you know, when there's a severe crisis, uh, it's not forcing everyone to come to work. It's an option, voluntary. Um, and uh, it's, it's not alternative to sort of conventional things the public sector will do. And so we can talk about design. But, I love this graphic. Oh, the things you can think up if you only try. What kind of jobs can we do? And in every major direct employment program, we have seen examples in the social care sector, in the arts and cultures. You know, think about the New Deal uh, projects, the theater project, the musicians, the uh, you know the 
uh, oral history projects, the murals, I mean, uh, they can be created employment opportunity for um, uh, anyone, youth engagement programs, environmental services, we'll talk more about that, et cetera. And I say make the American job centers great again, maybe not again, because the American job centers are not job centers. They are unemployment centers. They call them job centers, but when you go to an employment center, you can get um, unemployment insurance, you know, you can get training, some sort of support. Um, but uh, if there aren't enough employment opportunities, you can strike out and not be guaranteed employment. Of course, we have legacy, forgotten legacy. You know, this is just what the New Deal did. And the New Deal wasn't even, I mean, it was big by the standards of the time, but it wasn't big enough to employ every person. However, it was so popular, specifically the Civilian Conservation Corps, was so popular that people began to understand these as a right, that the access to this kind of employment was, was uh, a basic right. And unfortunately, FDR was convinced by a conservative budget director to not to reauthorize the New Deal, and uh, we uh, kind of abandoned the direct employment approach. All right. So how do we go about this? Really, the climate conversation is the most important one. I mean, we've got absolutely no time. Um, we have we need all hands on deck, anyone and everyone, um, to address uh, the climate concerns. And we also have a recognition that a just transition has to come along with the just transition of the labor force. There is some legislative infrastructure. And I don't want to oversell this because we are still a long way away from just shifting the paradigm. But that was the mission and aspiration of the Green New Deal, to recognize that we need very bold public approach to the transition that is multifaceted, but it is grounded in guaranteeing a decent uh, employment at family sustaining wages for everyone that we can't have anyone left behind. And so there is a resolution that articulates what the federal job guarantee should look like. And then there are, there's a slew of bills that uh, are incorporating the direct guaranteed employment approach in their other goals, like a uh, New Deal for cities, towns, and um, the Civilian Climate Corps, Jobs and Justice, it's the Thrive Act, et cetera. I'm about to conclude, I just wanna say, you know, it is nice that we have the CCC and the big Build Back Better, but the budget is so pitifully small that it does not promise many jobs at all. And I think we had calculated at one point that the budget was so small that maybe you could get like 20,000 jobs per year. We can't, that is completely inadequate, you know, considering the job insecurity the economy still experiences. How should we? we do it? Well, it's a good infrastructure. We can start there and we can say open a permanent uh, CCC office in every county and the New Deal had a New Deal office, you know, New Deal project in every county. Then supply projects with the CCC, climate projects. Every community has a climate project that's needed. Supply those projects and job lists to the American job centers, supply them to employers, find ways to advertise them, but the unemployment offices will be a good place where people can go for the job lists and be, you know, use, use them as jobs banks. Create national online jobs portal, invite local community created jobs uh, because communities are already taking care of uh, the social inequities, economic insecurity, environmental challenges. To empower them, employ the, their know-how. Uh, they've been doing this work. They just need a lot more of it. Pay at least $15 an hour health, paid leave, childcare. I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, we, in our proposal, in my proposal, I have childcare because it's a huge obstacle to finding, take, you know, like good employment. Um, hire everyone who shows up. I think this is really the key to make sure that it's a demand-driven uh, program. And I'm happy to talk about demand, uh, the, the Indian program, but I'm just going to wrap up with, with, the, with the popularity. Um, it has been polled multiple times. Um, consistently, it's 70% and above the popularity. And when you break it down, um, it, it shares Gardner's uh, big support among different groups. Uh, including uh, conservative corners. Okay, so this is for the US, but we've done the polls recently in other countries. 
Actually, this was uh, in the context of the pandemic. The, the Gallup uh, poll that found that 93% of respondents supported a national employment and training initiative that creates paid work for the unemployed. Uh, in the UK, there was a, a poll in 2020, again, job guarantee in the 70s. And when polled compared to universal basic income, job guarantee is, always has a significant advantage. This is the polling that happened in France. Again, from the far left to the far right, very robust support for the program. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I said, it's a, it is a, um, it seems to be recapturing the imagination of people, but we have concrete forerunners and programs that are running today in France, um, in India and in Austria, um, in, in the developed world that can be the template for implementing this approach. It is a significant break from the way traditionally we deal with economic insecurity and unemployment. And uh, for that, I thank you. Open to questions. So everyone, please continue to send questions on the chat box. Victor was saying mm -hmm. Q&A box is not working, right? Yes. yes. I can read the questions that we have. Oh, so Walker is asking, does this idea work any differently when we implement it as a tool to recover from a crisis or a recession versus when it is implemented day to day in a healthy economy? So. Yes, I think, uh, thank you for the question. I think it's a really pertinent question. If we, I mean, typically these have been implemented as crisis tools. So, you know, think about the Great Depression, uh, a program I studied was in Argentina. If it is not there as a permanent policy, usually it comes too late. Usually it comes when unemployment has already um, developed and it, it kind of develops in this avalanche effect. You know, you, you know, the loss of income means that somebody else has lost their income because you know, you're not patronizing businesses, you're not spending. And so there's this kind of vicious cycle when you lose your income and there's instability of income and maybe there's some temporary income support, but you pull back, right? Your expenditures much more drastically um, than if you know that you can get access to living wage employment. So it's macroeconomic effect, it's a psychological effect Economists that do not try to maintain full employment over the long run are more unstable economies. But economists that target full, full tight full employment, you know, very stable employment um, over the long run uh, don't have these fluctuations. So I like to use the examples of the Swedish model the, where the government effectively would act as the employer of last resort. Um, lifetime employment in Japan, you know, countries that have had one to 2% unemployment over a long period of time, they don't have the big yo-yo. So in that sense, if you have a standby policy for, for public employment, you have a better macroeconomic stabilizer. But as I said, on any given day, a community has depression level uh, unemployment rates. So why is this an acceptable scenario, right? That we uh, kind of ignore, forget, don't look at these rural, urban, com coastal communities, right? And that is considered kind of an inevitable, you know, scenario. I think that uh, we can have much more restorative approach to macro policy if we just have a permanent direct employment. Thank you. Yeah, this is a great answer. Uh, Karen has another question about when you mentioned that a large percentage of Americans find themselves in low quality work conditions, but they are technically still employed. So do you think this framework is also trying to deal with that kind of issue or are we only talking about quantity of people being employed? Uh, yes, the employment guarantee the public option will will more or less serve as some sort of standard that's missing at, at this moment um you know i said one in three americans are earning below 15 but many many more like many of them are earning way below 15 so imagine you know you're a single parent we saw women represent a lot of that population 
single parent and you're juggling a bunch of jobs and you're just not able to make ends meet, you can say no uh, to that job. You can say no to an abusive employer. I showed you some numbers on wage theft. People don't have a re recourse today. Unemployment is powerful. It structures our decisions. E economic insecurity makes us put up with all sorts of situations. And, and I don't wanna at all argue that we're gonna solve discrimination in the labor market, but it gives a very important lever of negotiation or just a choice to be able to move and find what would be kind of the basic standard that we as a you know, civilized society think everybody should have. Um, if you're, and you know, it has positive macro effects. So if you're an employer, uh, you know, you, you pay, you pay the wage, you have the, the clients, the customers, and you, you match, um, the page, the wage. Um, if you're, you know, if you're a poverty paying employer, you will have a hard time, but we probably don't want them in business anyway. Thank you. Yeah, Zakaria wants to ask something. Yes. Yeah. So, so I just had a question about. I think uh, when I uh, when I see statistics for employment rate, so basically the number of people employed relative to the working age population, the U.S. tends to have a low rate, about sixty percent, compared to you know certain European countries that have rates close to eighty percent. Uh, what do you think are the causes of that? Like primarily, what what causes people? number of people that are working age to not uh, uh low participation rates yeah employment. yeah i mean some of it has to do with the support for caregivers uh, we have a very poor um support system uh for caregivers and so you know women's labor force participation rate uh has been uh, traditionally low, but not among black women. They have always had higher than white women participation rates. Uh, white women have had low, and that kind of went up in the 70s and then plateaued, uh, mostly due to kind of the income insecurity of, of their partners or husbands specifically, uh, who used to bring family wages and then they couldn't anymore with the loss of manufacturing. So we um, we have obstacles to employment. I would say for many, a, a critical obstacle would be transportation. Um, but I think that the social wage will be a, a, an important determinant um, to how you can engage in the, in the paid labor market. Thank you. Uh, Victor, I see you have raised your hand. Do you have a question? Uh, yes. Um, so I'm curious if you um you're saying that this wouldn't poach jobs away but i guess i'm wondering like is that you know could it could it could it act, in fact poach jobs but even would that be a problem like i'm, I'm thinking for example in academia uh you could be a, a phd with a lot of uh background in chemical engineering if you go into a postdoc or want to go into academia you're going to be overworked working for very little money relative to your skill level you could easily go into industry and make significantly more money is this maybe something the federal government could use, uh, federal jobs guarantee program to also poach uh, high skilled talent from certain sectors of the economy and redirect it to other areas? So saying we need chemical engineers working to, you know, uh, develop desalinization plants on the East Coast. So we're just going to like offer these very high skilled jobs and poach talent from high skilled uh, sectors. So the proposal um, for public employment is to secure the floor. It's, so it is not really to match uh, this, the wage with the high skill, you know, or at the, across the income distribution to provide employment opportunities at the skill level. Um, and it's not a perfect approach. I, I can appreciate, especially for, you know, people do experience employment and security of their engineers. But the way the economy works and the labor market works is that the engineers typically have some more uh, easier access to reemployment, so they don't experience the insecurity for a longer period of time, savings and assets. And so um, it is really dealing with, with the, the most kind of unstable, precarious em employment effect. So that's the job guarantee. It is the public option of what we consider to be the basic guaranteed employment. But because what we because the minimum wage is so pitifully low, and we are really talking about boosting it up. I can imagine poaching that this this program could attract people who are in these like very very precarious. Uh, so it will have some disruptive effect at the, the in that precarious labor market segment. So I think that 
One way to do this is just to combine it with a formal official increase in the wage, the minimum wage, which many states are doing, um, but do it at the uh, federal level. And then if you can combine it with also benefits and all of these reforms that we've been fighting for, Medicare for all, then that would be easier because it will be comprehensive policy. So I would say, uh, you know, this is the ideal case scenario. Um, I think that there is a good reason for the public sector to support high skill uh, work, to invest in the public areas of strategic concern that have been underfunded for very long time. And here I really uh, just direct you to the work of Mariana Mazzucato, who's talking about the entrepreneurial state, um, who demonstrates how critical this public investment is. Uh, and when you think about the public purpose in the context of a Green New Deal, we recognize that we need truly all manner of skill and know-how and technology. So we need the public sectors to stand behind those initiatives as well. Um, I would say that, um, it is a difficult comparison to make, but um, I, I'm looking to India's rural employment program, which um, employs about 30 to 40% of rural households. It is huge by all standards. And it expanded dramatically in COVID because a lot of urban folk moved back to the rural areas, were looking for employment and they accessed employment through the program. There are many, challenges okay so it's not exactly you know uh living wage employment it's not fully guaranteed full-time employment but it it is an add-on the program uh, is an add-on and adds value to communities so it doesn't seem to be coming at the expense of other firms but actually comes as a as an addition to a rural improvement to water conservation, a whole bunch of other um, kind of uh, green rural initiatives. Thank you, Representative. So I guess we can take a couple more questions. I also had a question along the same line as Walker. So, so we saw the polls, everything looks great. It looks like a great idea. So where is most of the resistance coming from? What are the arguments against it like probably like walker says it's like how do we pay for it or this will lead to inflation maybe people are still not convinced so is the way is the major challenge coming from voter base popularity thing they are not interested and we need to have more discourse or is it more coming from the federal government policymaker labels or and what are the counter arguments against yeah. those i guess I mean, I think that this is, you know, what is the obstacle? This is the question that I think, you know, uh, you can ask of what are the obstacles to the Green New Deal? What are the obstacles to Medicare for all? These are super popular. Like people want, you know, they want you to, they want childcare, they want paid leave. And so I think, you know, there is for sure a kind of a issue of policy paradigm um, that we are coming off this kind of wave of the government can do anything, you know, the government has to mind its budget. Uh, and these are critical disempowering narratives that we, I think we're making some strides to debunk challenge and, um, you know, offer an alternative. So the budget is a very interesting one because COVID is like yet another teachable moment, as was the great financial crisis. You have a crisis, you pass the budget. You want to pay for something, you have the money. There are just no questions asked, and it doesn't stop you from paying for the next crisis. We have the funds. So, I mean, and it's still there are uh, policymakers which will go out there and say, well, we don't have the we don't have the money. I mean, it is so so that is one narrative we've been working very hard to kind of debunk. The other one is the role of government. I think that there is a kind of an ideological divide that we need to find a way to rehabilitate the public purpose without this old uh, and tiresome kind of socialism, capitalism, you know, dichotomy. Like we have concrete challenges. They are existential to address, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a climate crisis, and we need to have a, a combined approach. And so I think that the, you know, the, the, the anti kind of government can do anything stance is, is powerful with, uh, with Congress. 
but not with people. You give people jobs and it's, it's amazing how popular these are. And as I said, I have, you know, you know, people are calling me who are, you know, Republican uh, congressmen or, you know, uh, who are who are interested in, in direct employment. It's, it's a very tangible policy. So uh, I'm not sure I have a I have a good answer for, you know, why we're not doing these things that people support. Thank you, Zakaria. I think we can end with your question. Yeah. So uh, there has you showed one poll where you compared support for the job guarantee and support for universal basic income and you know universal basic income was one of those policies that uh, that is also like gaining a lot of attention recently. Uh, can you speak a little bit about you know what is a universal basic income and what do you think the advantages and disadvantages of it compared to a job guarantee? Well, you have to invite me for another talk. <laughs> <to just go>. <laughs> <laughs> but um, listen, in very simple terms, um, the universal basic income basically is kind of, it kind of comes from the same place. It recognizes that the labor market creates it doesn't provide the security that that people are experiencing, and that we could just provide income that is disconnected from employment uh, and it's guaranteed. Now, um, you know, to me, that's a bit of a kind of surrender to we can't fix the labor market, right? Because at the end of the day, the, the, the labor market is connected to production, output, employment. So we want to make sure that we are creating opportunities there, um, both because people want them and because we're producing things, right? And so when you survey people, they do want work. Um, what they don't want is punitive work. They hate, right? Like onerous conditions. So do we have a, a capacity to reform that model or do we just say, okay, you're done. You can quit your job and we'll give you income. People, uh, we know this, the research shows us that the poverty is much more than just loss of income and you know, people have far many more th benefits that they derive from employment. So to me, that's why I, you know, I focus on the job guarantee. I always say that it is situated within a framework of economic security. And so income support will have to be a component of the package. We, not everyone can, should, would work, and we need to find um, ways to support them in, in, uh, in other ways, right? Retirement income, child support, free tuition. This is all basic income, but it's different from universal basic income, which is giving living income to every single person, rich or poor, at all times, right? Irrespective of what the phase of the business cycle is, uh, as, a, as a kind of entitlement to all. I have many, many, many uh, problems with this vision. Great. This was a very great discussion. Thank you so much again, Dr. Chernova.